everyone. Uh, we'll call the uh, regular meeting of City Council for Monday, March 14th to order. Um, our first delegation, our first item on the agenda this morning is our delegations and uh, 2.1. We have Heather DeSarmia, Public Relations from TC Energy and Barrett Kennedy, uh, socioeconomic advisor from TC Energy are in attendance to give us an update on the Coastal Gas Link project. So good morning, Heather. Good morning, Barrett. Welcome. Uh, we'll turn the floor over to you or the screen over to you, I guess. Great, thank you. You know what, just, I was hoping to pop in on camera here. Uh, just, there we go. It should be turning on here shortly. Good morning, everybody. Could you give me a quick thumbs up if you could see my screen? Uh, good morning. morning. We're, yep, everything's good, Heather. You're on the screen and we can hear you fine. So welcome, it's good to see you. Great, thank you for having us here today. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. So uh, we are happy to virtually with an update on the Coastal Gas Link Pipeline project. I am joined uh, by Barrett Kennedy, our socioeconomic advisor. He will be leading the discussion with me this morning. Uh, we also have a few subject matter experts uh, joining the call in the wings here as well. We've got Jason Core, project engineer for Work Package One, and Matthew Quinlan, project manager of our Wild Lake Compressor Station. Uh, so we'll be leading the discussion today and of course, uh, happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, I'll move ahead to the next slide here. We will um, have time for Q&A at the end, but please, if there's at any point during the discussion, if you do have a question, uh, please feel free to pipe in. Um, just with my screen here, I don't necessarily always see the hands up feature, so please just uh, feel free to say excuse me and jump right in. So in the, in the interest of time, we will be moving through these next two standard slides fairly quickly, uh, but for many of you in the room that are familiar with it, uh, Coastal Gas Link is being built and will be operated TC Energy. And of course, it's one of uh, North America's largest uh, natural gas pipeline operators. So of course, Coastal Gas Link is of course our most significant investment in British Columbia. So as a very quick overview refresher, our project is a 670 kilometer long pipeline that will safely deliver natural gas from the Dawson Creek area, so right in your backyard, um, over to Kitimat, BC. It's there that LNG Canada will then prepare it for global market. So as you can see here map, sections one and two of the project are located right here within the Peace River Regional District. So as I move on to the next slide here, we've had some significant momentum um, taking off construction in 2022. So as we wrap up construction in the first quarter, we are quite proud to share that we've reached about 60% overall co completion on the project with over 3,600 workers across the route as of the end of January. So of course, we continue to safely move forward with construction while still being by the industrial camps order and keeping the health and safety and the community, of course, at the forefront. So not featured on this slide, but exciting news that we announced last week. We are proud to announce that TC Energy has signed option agreements to sell a 10% equity interest in Coastal Gas Link um, to two entities. And these two entities are representing coast, uh, First Nation communities along our route. So we've made this agreement available to all 20 Indigenous communities that are holding existing partnership agreements on our, our project. We've also announced back on March 3rd that the project welcomed Nadley Macro to the project and they're supporting our construction efforts out in section five. So this is actually the, the second um, major indigenous joint venture partnership um, supporting our construction efforts along the route. Um, not sure if you remember, but we did welcome Ledcor Heisla uh, to the project as well uh, last May. So as we jump back into the construction side of things, our teams have been very busy with water crossings past year. We've actually completed eight of the nine major uh, significant water crossing um, areas along the route. Uh, you'll see here on the a photo on the slide here is actually um, water crossing activity at the Parsnip River just outside of section three. So really across the route, we're seeing all facets of pipeline construction taking place. Um, we'll be heading over to the next slide here where we will focus a little bit more specifically on the Peace region. So as a friendly reminder, Work Package 1 um, really up uh, the Peace region. And so we're going from uh, Ground Verge to really east of McLeod Lake. The prime contractor responsible for construction in this area is Serreras Murphy Joint Venture. So in the, in the first quarter of this year, we've seen some really major milestones. Uh, we've completed the clearing 
and we wrapped up about 95% of the grading work. We've also seen about 104 kilometers of pipe in the ground, um, really making us hit about 74, 75% uh, completion for pipe installation right here in the piece. And then our team more recently has been working on the Coldstream Creek crossing, as well as, as well as some significant steep slope work down in section two, which I'll get to shortly. Uh, but this photo here is really neat on the right hand side. Um, it's an orchestrated approach by almost 30 side booms working together to complete the work at Coldstream Creek Crossing. I would like to mention that the workforce does continue to leverage our accommodations at Mount Mayor. And of course, uh, we are leaning on the Sunset Prairie Lodge as well. And then we do have a few folks uh, staying in some local Chatwind accommodations as well. I did want to wrap up this slide here by mentioning that as of the end of December, uh, there, were, there was over $12 million in contracting awarded to distinct Dawson Creek businesses uh, right here in the area. So on the last slide, I did mention that there was some significant steep slope work taking place. Um, so to help better show this, uh, the team from Sereris Murphy was able to put together a few visuals to showcase the construction efforts in section two. Um, so some of you may be familiar, but some not. Uh, but we are spanning uh, about three mountain areas. So we've got Murray, Burnt, and the Merrick Mountains. So the figure on the right-hand uh, side corner of the slide here showcases the pre- and post-grade uh, slope requirements for say, pipeline construction and installation. So in the interest of time, I will move on, but you can see that Sirius Murphy does have some challenging terrain in Section 2 uh, to work through. So lastly, I did want to mention, and actually, sorry, not lastly for our presentation, but for this first uh, portion here, um, I did want to mention that we also have construction taking place on the Wild Lake Compressor Station. Um, we often sometimes refer to this as the beating heart of coastal gas link. So our team from ACON um, is the prime contractor leading construction out there, and they do have the support at a time of over about 160 to 180 workers um, with the construction there. Uh, they are moving forward with some significant uh, large bore piping installation, and they've also got some significant ongoing compressor unit construction. Um, inside and internally, they've got some electrical and instrumentation work taking place as well. So uh, one of the sort of preferred ways to help showcase some of the uh, before and after or continued progress is actually really this photo side by side. So uh, you'll see here we've got a snapshot from last July. Um, mirrored against a photo from this past February. So think of it as a bit of a where's Waldo. You can identify uh, some of the major top 10 major changes on uh, construction progress made. So I will end things off uh, right here for a moment, but we will turn things over where, uh, to Barrett where he's going to lead the next portion of our discussion. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you so much, Heather, and thank you all so much for sharing your time today to uh, have a discussion and share information. Uh, as Heather mentioned, my name is Barrett Kennedy. I'm Coastal Gaslink's Social and Economic Advisor. And if you are having trouble hearing me, please just interrupt me and let me know, and I will uh, change things up to make it better. Uh, so I wanted to uh, take the opportunity to uh, discuss the implementation of our project's Social and Economic Effects Management Plan. Uh, otherwise known as the C. And this is part of condition number 24 of our project's environmental assessment certificate. Uh, we implement this management plan, particularly to manage and mitigate potential impacts on community infrastructure and services. So on this slide, you can see the main subjects that the C focuses on, uh, including economic and municipal services, as well as transportation and traffic. Uh, so part of our implementation, is twice a year we publicly share a monitoring report which summarizes these activities. We shared the last report this past December directly to you. That was the sixth report, covered the months of June to November of 2021. And the highlights of that report included effects of the fourth wave of pandemic and efforts by the project in collaboration with Northern Health to boost workforce vaccination rates, uh, access road maintenance and mitigation uh, is discussed in the report as well as waste volume reporting and updated information related to apprenticeship initiatives. Uh, in these reports, you can also find regular items like lodge occupancy forecasts, uh, information related to telecommunications use, as well as a project injury table. 
And Heather, could you move to the next slide, please? So currently we're in our seventh uh, socioeconomic reporting cycle. You can expect to see that report this coming June. And uh, we'll be keeping a close eye on training and employment monitoring is construction use completion and local housing is another topic uh, for monitoring in many communities. And here's some of the feedback we've been receiving to date. Uh, obviously COVID-19 is a uh, mental wellness is still something people are discussing with us. Things are changing quite rapidly in that space. So we're keeping an eye on it. And economy, education, training, emergency response planning as we move into this Summer wildfire uh, response planning, something a project works carefully with communities on. And as I mentioned, uh, housing and traffic is uh, also uh, some core subjects of these reports. And Heather, could you move to the next slide, please? And uh, I uh, put these in just to highlight um, the categories, sort of the subjects that uh, we're interested in discussing here um, community economic uh, contract procurement, uh, skill of labor shortage is something we're uh, quite interested in, in, in discussing. And Heather, could you move to the next slide? And here's some of the other uh, topics for discussion uh, related to the socioeconomic effects management plan. Uh, emergency and health, obviously, big ones, social services, waste management. Uh, so just some ideas, uh, if you have any questions or comments that uh, may be related to these topics, we're, we're more than happy to hear them. And, and we really wanna look, uh, we really wanna hear from you and uh, hear some feedback. So thank you so much. Great, thanks Barrett. So we've got um, just one or two slides here really to wrap up, but um, we did wanna definitely emphasize this point here that once our project is operational, it will play an important role in the global energy transition. It is estimated that the natural gas exports facilitated by our project could actually reduce the global um, annual CO2 emissions by 60 to 90 million tons per year. And this actually equates to more than the total annual emissions seen right here in the province of BC. Um, something that's really neat that I want to make sure that we are sharing is that we're implementing some, te some technology out at, at the Wild Lake Compressor Station that will reduce the CO2 emissions by more than 2,100 tons per year. So this is actually the equivalency of taking or offsetting about 473 passenger cars from the road annually. So liquefied natural gas or LNG is one of the world's fastest growing major energy sources and and the global demand is projected um, to rise significantly over the next 20 years. So it really, it provides a unique opportunity for British Columbia to help replace um, really higher carbon emitting uh, fuels such as coal with cleaner energy uh, sources. So we are proud in a role, or we are proud of the role that we are playing in the energy transition while leaving a lasting legacy in our local communities. So really I would, I will wrap things up here and we now welcome any questions that anyone in the room may have this morning. Thank you, Heather. Uh, Barrett, uh, we appreciate your uh, presentation this morning. I'll pass it over to Council. Uh, anybody have any questions or comments for Heather or Barrett? Um, two things, I guess, for me. Obviously, we're um, pleased to have you guys here this morning and uh, really exciting to see the uh, progress of the project at 60%. When's the expected completion uh, time of the project um, and the second is um, has there obviously with what's going on uh, today in the world the capacity of the coastal pipe is more than 2 BCF which is your, now the uh, capacity that originally planned by LNG Canada is there any discussions right now to uh, at all to increase that and get it to maximum capacity uh, for LNG Canada? Well, th those are really great questions. So again, thank you for having us here today. Um, to tackle the first portion uh, there for you. So we still are very much on track for our 2023 in service date. Uh, we absolutely will continue to provide updates should this date change. Um, but you know, thanks to the welcoming additions, of course, we're bringing Nodley Macro on board. We're looking re really looking forward to uh, finishing off strong in the home stretch for our construction. Um, Yes, so very exciting as well. Um, we do have, of course, as you're under, as as you've mentioned, um, we are building Coastal Gas Link really essentially to almost function at half capacity right now. So as you mentioned, the 2.1 billion uh, BCU. So 
Uh, we continue to work with LNG Canada to identify those opportunities for adding additional uh, compression to the pipeline unit as required. Um, you know, very unfortunate what just devastating what's taking place um, globally and what's unfolding right now. Um, however, we do extend our thoughts and support to those impacted in the situation. Uh, but however, we are focusing our efforts on moving forward with safe construction and uh, moving forward um, and working alongside LNG Canada to meet our timeline. So, um, you know, we are looking at additional uh, permitting to be able to expand uh, capacity should that be needed, uh, but looking forward to moving that along and sharing those updates as they become available. Thank you, Heather. Um, so thank you guys so much for being here this morning. We appreciate uh, your time and information and update and uh, look forward to the completion of Coastal in 2023 and adding another uh, significant economic um, impact to our region and our province and our country. So thank you guys so much. We appreciate it. Great. Thank you. Have a great rest of the day, everyone, and feel free to reach out with any other follow-up questions. We will for sure. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Um, item 2.2 is our next uh, delegation this morning. We have... Um, uh, we haven't seen him for a bit, so we're happy to have him back in person. Uh, MLA Mike Bernier, and uh, he's got a couple of his interns with him this morning, Margarita Simon and intern Mitch Robinson. And Mike's in this morning to give us a bit of an update on some of the provincial business, and uh, perhaps we'll touch on the electoral area, electoral boundary uh, issue that we're facing right now in our province. Welcome. It's good to have you here and uh, back in council and... Uh, I'm going to turn your mic on here, and you're away to go. Good Excellent. morning. Good morning. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me. It's great to to see your worship and council and and all the staff. Um, appreciate being here in person. I probably look better on 2D, so maybe I could have zoomed in. But uh, it's good to be here. And uh, thank you for introducing as well, uh, Margarita and uh, Mitch, who are up here from Victoria. Uh, they're up here for the week as uh, Victoria uh, interns to to see a little bit more of the province, uh, see the differences of the province. I think uh, they're already experiencing a lot of that, especially with the snow this morning. Uh, so that was a, a bit of an eye opener waking up to that. But. Uh, uh, first of all, I just want to start. Thank you very much uh, to to yourself, your worship, and council, uh, and staff here at the city. I know the last uh, couple of years have been very difficult, uh, very very trying. It's great to be here without a mask on, and uh, start to see things getting a bit to uh, to what we would uh, hope to see is uh, is normal and get back to that. And I know it's been very trying for. Uh, a lot of businesses specifically in our, our community over the last couple of years. So uh, we're hoping that we're starting to uh, see things turn into a, a positive direction, uh, at least around this file where we can get back to normal, uh, whatever that may or may not be going forward. And, uh, and again, just want to thank you because I know as a, as, a, as a mayor and as a, as a council, uh, as, a, as a city, uh, you're not the decision makers, uh, but you're obligated uh, to follow the rules. And I want to thank you for doing that, uh, because whether we agree or disagree sometimes uh, on the rules, we still have a role to play, we still have a job to do, and making sure as a, as a community uh, that we're following through for the safety of people. So I know it's been a difficult year for, for a lot of you, and I just want to thank you for, uh, for your leadership, for stepping up and, and doing what you could uh, to help people in our community. Uh, as as you uh, said, Your Worship, so we're uh, we're back in Victoria, and one of the uh, things that uh, is top of mind for some of us, and I say some of us as uh, as a highlight, is uh, around the electoral boundaries, as you uh, mentioned. Maybe I'll jump into that first, um, and then we'll open up for questions later if you what if you have any. But uh, um, I know most of you around this table know the issue that we're facing with the electoral boundaries. I talked to the CAO quickly. We have not heard yet of any dates where the Electoral Boundaries Commission is coming to rural British Columbia. Uh, we expect them to. Uh, they, uh, they better. <laughs> the, uh, rural British Columbia is the one that's going to be impacted the most. Let me backtrack a little bit on this. So the legislation has been changed. Uh, for those that maybe are, are not aware, uh, every two elections, the uh, Electoral Boundaries Commission is tasked to look at uh, the ridings in the province. Right now we have 87 ridings, 87 MLAs. Um, up until a couple of, well, I guess up until last year, 
there was legislation in place that 17 of the ridings, which is the rural ridings, had, uh, there was a mandate that they could not be eliminated. Boundaries could change um, and move around, but you could not reduce the number of rural seats because we're seeing that, you know, 95% of the population growth of this province is south of Hope. We all acknowledge that, we all see that. Um, so our fear was we didn't want, did not want to have less rural representation. So there was legislation put in place to, to ensure that you could not take away MLA seats in rural BC. Well, last year, uh, the present government removed that section out of the legislation and has tasked the Electoral Boundaries Commission to basically look at population only when they're looking at creating the uh, boundaries uh, for the uh, electoral ridings for the legislature. So they're looking at approximately 60 to 65,000 in ballpark um, people per riding because they want to go by population. They're not taking into consideration uh, GDP. They're not taking into consideration the geographical uh, challenges. There is a fine line at the very bottom of the legislation that says they can deviate off of the population numbers under extreme circumstances only. No idea what that means. Nobody's been able to uh, give us a clear answer on that. So uh, I guess long story short on this one is the legislation has been tasked where the Electoral Boundaries Commission can <coughs> increase up to 93 ridings, so six new MLA seats, which would be all down in the Lower Mainland. But they're also looking at now under this new um, terms of reference they have of amalgamating a good portion of rural ridings together and eliminating the representation and also taking those same lost seats and increasing them down into the lower mainland. So there could be a loss of anywhere from six to eight, we think, uh, rural seats, which adds, there'll be a net increase possibly of 12 to 14 new MLA seats in the lower mainland. Uh, so we need to really flag that as a challenge for rural BC. You know, this is not about, uh, and I always have to try to be careful, yes, I'm the, presently the MLA, but who knows if I'm running again or what'll happen. Uh, so it's not, it's not about me, it's not about the present MLAs, it's about the future representation for, for the regions. Uh, the Peace region is obviously one of them they're looking at. They, uh, because of population, Peace River North, uh, and Peace River South together have around 60, 65,000 people. So it fits perfectly into that umbrella of what they'd like to do population wise. Uh, but anybody who knows the map of British Columbia, that riding would be almost one fifth of the uh, geography, one fifth of the land mass of the province for one MLA, for one representative. Um, distance wise, that would be the riding from Prince George all the way to Point Grey that's the same geographical distance, that would be one MLA. Uh, right now, the riding of Peace River South, uh, right here, uh, geographically is the same size of the entire lower mainland that has 46 MLAs. So the argument that we're trying to give back for, for, that we're hoping to get a lot of pushback from rural BC is it should not be just about population, it should be about fair, adequate representation for the people as well. Because you can imagine if there's one MLA and you're from Mackenzie all the way to the Yukon border, um, how often will the MLA be able to get out? How often can people access face-to-face uh, -face that person? Um, and I think everybody in this table knows uh, the difference between a rural seat and downtown Vancouver. Uh, Your Worship, you remember when we had Sam Sullivan, former mayor of Vancouver, uh, came up to this region when he was the MLA in downtown Vancouver uh, he was telling us you could ride your bike around his entire riding in about half an hour and never had anybody even come to his office because they don't have oil and gas, rural roads, hunting. They don't have all the issues that we deal with in rural BC. Um, plus, they'll have 13 MLAs in downtown Vancouver area with one mayor. Uh, so tell me who's got more representation, right? So... I will just end this part by just asking um, that, you know, obviously I know that you are uh, been vocal about this a bit through the city, uh, through the regional district, uh, asking that, uh, and I apologize, I haven't, I'm not sure, Councillor Wilbur, if you're still on, but on NCLGA, if anybody here is on NCLGA anymore, but if not, we know that the uh, 
AGM will be up in, I believe, in Fort St. John early May. And so what we're asking is that uh, councils, especially in the NCLGA region, uh, if they have not already put a resolution forward, consider trying to find an opportunity for an emergency resolution for debate on this issue. Uh, because, as you can imagine, um, it's not really a hot topic in urban British Columbia. They're talking about getting more MLAs, more seats, more representation. So it's going to really need to be a, a vocal point on this. Um, just maybe uh, I'll just uh, quickly just say, and then if there's any questions, Your Worship, uh, uh, there's a lot going on. We're in session right now, so any issues that are arising, please uh, connect with me, as we always do, and, and just give me a shout. Uh, the only other hot topic right now that I'll say that, uh, and I'm meeting with uh, some members of the local sportsman club. Last week I met with the Guide Outfitters and the uh, BC Wildlife Federation, and this is around, once again, uh, changes to uh, the landscape in the area around hunting regulations and the access to the outdoors. We all witnessed this, as you know, with your CAO, uh, Mr. Lextrom, a couple of years back with the challenges around access to the backcountry around caribou uh, closures and what we saw, what government imposed on our region. And now what they're doing is the same thing and looking at shutting down um, hunting to moose and uh, even more caribou up north. Uh, per, per capita, if I can say that, we have more moose up here than pretty well anywhere in the province uh, and now they're turning around and saying that they want to reduce um, hunting rights. They are doing it and I won't get deep into it right now, they're doing it under the discussion of the Blueberry uh, Yahi decision um, but we know there's probably more to it than just that so uh, we're going to have a deep discussion on this one and have to push back on that as well. Um, anyway I could talk all morning on all the issues going on in Victoria, but I thought I just wanted to come and say hi, say thank you, and uh, then see if there's any questions from yourselves. Thank so you, thanks Mike. Thanks very much, Your Worship. Thank you. Uh, questions from Council? Councillor um, Earl? Thank you, Your Worship, and uh, thank you, Mike. Good to see you. Um, question around uh, the province's uh, as yet unarticulated child care plans. I know in the last election that was a, a piece of their platform and the federal government uh, echoed that sentiment in the last election and it looks like they've allocated some money but I have yet to see what that's going to look like and I ask because uh, there's, I mean we've gotten some questions and, and there have been some, I don't want to say downloading but they seem keen to as a municipal government involve us in some of the logistical mm -hmm. Um, work and it's something that you know we're not really resourced to get into the child care business and I was just wondering um, that piece if they, they've gotten any more details around that and number two it's my understanding that the subsidies m that are going to be made available are going to be exclusive to government run and non-profit child care and that the private sector is essentially going to be left out, which is going to be a, a big change for us, not only, it, you know, given the percentage of, of child care in town that is run privately, but uh, whether those folks transition to non-profit or government work or they just leave the industry altogether so we could end up overall with less child, child care and as somebody with a kid in daycare and who knows a lot of people with kids in daycare, that's a concern. So if you could speak to that, that'd be appreciated. Yeah, uh, appreciate that, Councillor. I mean, one of the challenges um, that we're seeing around that is, you know, the the present provincial government has announced ten dollar a day child care for about the last ten, uh, well, sorry, five years, half a half a decade. It does require, as they say now, and not at the time, but they do say now that it requires some federal uh, dollars and support and intervention. Uh, you are you are right that they are announcing right now supports that they're trying to get to to maybe a $20 a day, so they're not at the 10, they're announcing up maybe to $20 a day childcare in select areas for um, publicly funded and run uh, childcare. So as you said, private areas, which is, a, I would say a lot of them, uh, especially in rural British Columbia areas, uh, are not on that list. In fact, uh, some of the challenges and debates that we've had in the House uh, that we can't get a st straight answer from the government on is, it, is they're determined, it seems, to basically slowly shut down or try to integrate the private centres into, into government or public 
funded uh, child care spaces to have a bit more control. One of the challenges and the problems right now, as you would know, Councillor, is, is sure, the, the dollars are, it's very expensive when you have children, but the, the biggest issue we're hearing is finding the spaces to begin with. Uh, there's just not enough spaces out there right now, and the, uh, the approach that government's taking right now is not to create more spaces, which is going to be a, a huge issue. So um, there wasn't a lot of money in the, this budget that was just announced. We're debating it right now. Uh, we have not got to the debates on childcare because we have a lot of them, a lot of questions to ask as well uh, during that because we're trying to get a clearer understanding of what, how this is going to impact um, people like yourselves and families because it's, it's great to make the announcement. It's another thing to see uh, the rubber on the road actually uh, helping families and that hasn't happened yet. So I wish I had better news for you, but that's uh, definitely an issue. Thank you. Councillor Dober. Uh, thank you, Worship. Uh, thanks, Mike, for your yeah. presentation. It's nice to hear from you. Um, just on the, the electoral boundary issues, mm -hmm. like, is that, you know, obviously, like, that could be pretty concerning for rural areas, um, you know, today and for our future. So is there, like, besides a letter from us or, some, you know, from our the area, is there more that can be done to, like, try and voice our concerns and maybe some people are positive about it and think it's good for our areas but you know just a way to express those yeah no i appreciate that uh, i mean really it's going to be from all councils hopefully we'll be uh, sending objection letters of loss of uh, access or representation as i said with the nclga area associations uh, ubcm will be probably will be too late uh, right now they're talking about all presentations needing to be in by i think I stand to be corrected, I think it was May 31st, the end of May is when they're hoping to have everything completed, which means they're going to be up here, hopefully up here, uh, into regions like ours uh, next month. The, they've done about 15 meetings so far around Vancouver, Surrey, Richmond and Vancouver Island, areas that are looking at growing, not shrinking. Um, so one of the things I do ask is once we, and I'll be publicizing as best as possible, but is when we get hopefully the commission up here, which is only three people that were appointed by government, by the way, um, so you know, they know who's on the, on the panel, um, but when they get up to this region, uh, anything you can do to help us spread the word to get people out face to face uh, in front of the commission, uh, because you know, we're, right now it's, it's a very lopsided. The last couple of meetings in Vancouver have had two or three people and they've all been people um, who have been supportive uh, of what the present government are doing, let's just uh, say, put it that way. They're, they've stacked the deck of making sure their people are out voicing why, how great this is. What's the fear of it a little bit is it's kept pretty quiet, yeah. right? Like not too many people are understand what it is and what it's, you know, what could potentially happen. Um, and it, yeah, it's concerning for for the growth of our area. For yeah, sure. so, I, and visuals mean a lot. So I've uh, asked staff and hopefully in the, this week I'll be getting a, a map of the province of what it would look like with the amalgamated seats and what the ridings would look like. So you'd get a very clear visual of the Peace Region, uh, basically everything from Houston all the way to Bella Coola being one riding as well. Once, once you see that, you can see the impact and I'm hoping we can just get that out more so people talk about it and yeah, okay. get involved. Thanks for that. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Parzal. I'll see you tomorrow morning. Yes, you I? will, Councillor. Yes. <laughs> Well, I'm not going to lob you an easy question. Okay. okay? Don't let you leave here <laughs> unscathed. <laughs> you know, uh, many of the issues I think we've all been dealing with uh, seem to be uh, at the federal level. Um, of course, there are provincial issues. And we have an MP that represents uh, the area, the entire Peace Region, and uh, parts of Prince George, and we have excellent access to him. Um, and, uh, you know, really, you talked about representation. You represent people, and your interaction isn't with trees and roads, it's with people. So isn't it logical that this uh, be, uh, the representation be linked to people? And <coughs> what's the problem? We have a good representation with, uh, with uh, Bob Zimmer, so... Uh, What's your problem? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I expect nothing less from Councillor Parsons uh, in a situation like this. Um, I mean, look, it's one of those things as a, 
as a province, we're trying to ensure that when you look at 90% of the population being down south and people already struggle, I'll talk about British Columbia, not from a, um, a national level, but if you talk to MP Zimmer, he'd say the same thing of how hard it is to have our voice heard in this region, to have our opinions heard in Ottawa, and in our case, in this case, in Victoria. We struggle already, and I, that's why uh, Dan Davies and I partner on as much as we can, because it's always two voices are better than one. But one of the biggest issues we have, and you know, you know, as your CAO would know, as a former MLA as well, um, there's not too many uh, back road farming operations in downtown Vancouver. There's not too many um, mines, oil and gas operations. And to the uh, councillor's point, those might be not as much people, but issues. But those are issues that represent uh, a huge part of our province. And you can, for our area, and from what we're saying for rural British Columbia, if you start losing those voices that we already struggle with having heard, um, put it in perspective, if there's 93 MLAs and 79 or 80 of them are now south of Hope, we already struggle with, uh, and I try not to be negative, my wife said since I got into opposition, I've become negative, um, and that's part of the job now, but you know, to have our issues heard around hunting that we're going to talk about tomorrow. Um, for 90% of the province, they don't think about that. Uh, to talk about the impacts of the reduction in oil and gas development when we have $4 billion that are being scared to Alberta this year and not going to be spent in this area, Victoria doesn't get that. And if you have 90% of the MLAs now representing urban British Columbia, uh, good luck having these issues brought to the table or to be discussed. And so from, from my end, uh, the last thing I would want to do is, have, is water down the difficult um, chances that we have of being heard already. So yes, to your point, Councillor, uh, the present government would rather go to population only, thinking that's the fair way to do it. Um, but I look at it and say it's the complete opposite. We have to find a, a solution that works for all of BC, not just a cookie cutter. I love your response. Thank you. I'm going to move on quickly. Councillor Wilbur, one last thank opportunity. You. I'm always quick. Um, well, thank you for coming, MLA Bernier. Um, on the daycare issue and, and when, you know, you're in Victoria and you're advocating something that I've had to deal with a lot in the last year and a half, is the actual application process for mm. parents. It, they, get, they finally give up. It takes so long. And so we have people in rural BC who are entitled to apply, and yet by the time they get funding, they're either done their training or they've just looked for another resource, a family member, because the information is not coming back. It, it is unbelievable how long it takes to even get an answer if you qualify or not. So okay. I just want to give you that little tidbit because I'm seeing it. And then on the boundaries, I just wanted to mention that, um, and you can confirm, people can put in their input as individuals. So I already have, and having spent the last two years driving that whole area, they, we are not in the cookie cutter, and they don't realize. And it's in between all of our municipalities, we have these smaller, unique little communities, and they count too. So it's not just about our municipalities and those larger areas that we have in our demographic. It's about all those little tiny places in between. Um, and, and so I just wanted to put that out there that yes, as a municipality, we should say something. Yes, as NCLG, we should say something. But as individuals, we can as well. So Absolutely. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank just you. Have to get that word out there more. Yeah. Thank you. I just, uh, Mike, I just want to, um, last week at the Peace River Regional District, uh, it did come before the board, uh, the electoral um, represent boundary issue and we are writing a letter and uh, have indicated that um, also to every community to do exactly that to write to uh, the Commission chair and we've got it on our we had received the email we will be dealing with it today under our um, council agenda and bring it forward and um, I'll talk to our um, regional director Leonard Hebert on NCLGA uh, just to make sure that it does uh, can get uh, some sort of a discussion point on there if it isn't on the agenda so thank you. uh thanks so much it's really good to have you here today and uh good to have 
uh, your uh, guests with you as well. It's nice to have you in Dawson Creek and uh, hope you enjoy your visit. And uh, again, it's uh, refreshing to be able to be back into some normalcy and be able to look each other and see the smile. And thank you for coming in this morning. My pleasure. Thanks for having thank me. Thank you. Thanks for what you're doing. Uh, uh, late items, uh, we have a memo from Councillor Dober, if I can have a motion to accept the late item. Councillor Kemp, second Councillor Earl, all those in favour? Opposed, carried. And so we'll Excuse deal with me, that. Your worship. Sorry? I believe the voting is working. Oh, moment. awesome. <laughs> uh, I just assumed it wasn't, so away we went. So uh, all those in favour? And... Opposed, and it's carried. Thank you. And so now we'll move to Councillor Dober, your memo. Um, I'm assuming everybody read through the memo that was put up, but I just uh, wanted to make a motion that um, that we provide uh, five thousand dollars of the thirteen thousand dollars to the um, South Peace Motorsports Association. And if seconded, I'll explain. Thank you. Do I have a seconder? Second. Councillor Wilbur, go ahead, Councillor Dober. Um, I just, I, I think everybody in here knows how I felt about this from the beginning, but I just, um, after the motorsports coming in here and doing their presentation and having some conversations with them, I just feel that it's, uh, you know, that I know they're on valuable city property that could be used, but they've also, you know, enhanced our property. Um, they bring a lot of... Um, events to our community which helps our um, economical growth um, and they're, they're a good group and they want um, you know us putting a tower up there could have potentially affect their parking a little bit so I feel like two thousand dollars isn't enough compensation um, for what we're getting for that there, there's some impact to them and and they're planning on building a kids playground and a kids track and um, they do a lot of cool stuff and uh, it's a good volunteer base and I, I know Jake's the president of it right now and uh, you know it's not about getting this money for anything else besides to you know just to improve their facility upgrade their water system um, so yeah so I, I, it's the only time I'm going to talk to it so I've talked lots about it over the last while but <laughs> that's uh, <laughs> that's not I? your call yeah <laughs> <laughs> You always remember the mayor's got the gavel. That's yeah, kind of the deal, you right? You that you were going to hit it. So. <laughs> Thank you, Darcy. You're Councillor welcome. Dober. Councillor Wilbur. Thank you. So I did meet with the motocross group um, to discuss um, their letter that they sent to us, but also um, how their organization works. So something that I found interesting that's different from other user groups in the city, whether it be baseball, soccer, dance, that are using uh, city facilities they don't get to regulate their fees. It's regulated for them. So whatever they're told from their district organization, that's all they can charge. They can't charge more. So when I looked at that, and I look at the work that they're doing, I mean, so they do have a, a smaller kids track that they actually want to move to make it safer um, and look at the people that they do employ uh, to be flaggers, that kind of stuff. And I looked back kind of through the history of council since I've been sitting here They've really, not, compared to other groups, have not really come and asked us for too much. So they've done something um, innovative. I know they were going to work with staff about location and stuff, which didn't seem to be a big issue. Um, so after talking to them, doing some homework and review, and, and I did explain to them it is very daunting when you come before council and you get 10 or 20 minutes and you've got to try and get all that information out. Sometimes it's not easy. Um, I am in support of Councillor Dober's uh, motion. I was actually, after talking to them, looking at a 60-40 split, 60 for them and 40 for the city, but this is pretty close. And it also gives them the leverage to apply for NDIT grants and other grants because they'll have some income every year. So I think it's a great opportunity. They haven't asked us for much. Um, they do understand what my frustration was at the last meeting and that you know, things were done differently way back when, but that's not how we're doing them now. So we did clear that air. So I do, I think this is an opportunity for us to have a little bit of income, but also support a group that is helping the economic development of our community when they hold races. So thank you. Thank you. Any further comments, Council? 
Ready for the question? All those in favor? Opposed? It's uh, I, I got it, but I didn't get the results. Did you get the results? Thank you. 5 2. Thank you. It's carried. And other new councillor business, please. Councillor Parzel, good morning. Good morning. How are you? Dandy. Good. <laughs> So related to this previous item of business, I was surprised that, uh, you know, our procedural bylaw allows for this. Um, I always was under the impression that our procedural bylaw required uh, new information. Um, and it, obviously it doesn't. And so I'm wondering if we need to, to look at that because We've had this matter now three times before council. Um, once it was uh, a motion for 2,000, which was carried, and then it was 4,000, which it was defeated, and now it's 5,000 and it's been approved. Re so reconsideration yeah. of a motion requires anyone um, has within 30 days, the mayor can bring back for reconsideration. And uh, reconsideration of the motion uh, can be brought back uh, within 30 days by a councillor who voted in favour of it. You can't, uh, but but this is a new motion. I uh, asked Brenda about it, and certainly uh, it was because it it's not the same motion for the four grand. Uh, it increased the amount, and it's a different motion. And for that, it can be brought. Um, the motion can be brought back to council. Yeah, I'm not saying that this was improper. Yeah. I'm just saying I believe there's a problem with our procedural <laughs> bylaw okay, that it. allows it. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you. No, I wasn't challenging in this instance your ruling. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it just seems to me that uh, I recall from some depths of my, I think my memory, which is still quite sound in spite of my age, that uh, either I'm getting confused with other organizations I've been associated with, but you could reintroduce it, provided there was some new information. And I'm wondering if we shouldn't consider that as a, a possible review of our procedural bylaw. I'll, ha yeah, I'll be happy to review that and uh, talk to Brenda about it. And then uh, uh, through our uh, review of those that procedure bylaw, I'm happy to bring that back. Thank you. Anything further? Oh, yes. Um, um, the uh, our MLA, uh, whose response I really appreciated, by the way, um, is going to be at our gun club, uh, sportsman's club, uh, tomorrow morning early to discuss some issues. But also uh, uh, he'll have the opportunity of reviewing a major, major development uh, down there. Uh, the sportsman's club... Uh, traditionally has about 700 uh, members and if you add because there's well, many of the memberships are family membership it gets to about 12 1400 people half of whom are Dawson city of Dawson Creek residents and about 40 percent rural residents and then we have about 10 percent of our membership from Alberta and um, this new facility that's been built, the indoor range, you'll, for those of you who've been in the community a long time, you recall the, the old range at the Kin Park. Uh, it was well used, and I believe it, uh, it got burned down or demolished uh, for some reason. But this is going to be the replacement for it. And it's about a $1.3 million project. And we've had some good financial support from the regional district. Uh, do it for this is capital support. The regional district always supports the operation of the the club, but the, with capital money this, for this project, NDIT, and there's other streams uh, that I'm not free to announce right now. But um, and the club has saved over about 12 years um, for this through the proceeds of their annual gun show, which is a major, major draw. It's probably the 
largest uh, gun show, I believe, in in the north, if not uh, out of the Vancouver area, certainly the bigger than the biggest one in the Alberta area north of Edmonton. Uh, but, uh, of course, there's been no gun shows now for two years. And um, the uh, just a, a, an alert that the uh, membership is asking why the city does not support its operation and why the city hasn't uh, contributed to the capital project like the regional district. And my answer has been because no one's asked. But so be prepared to receive some presentations on this matter. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Wilbur. Thank you. I have two things. First one, I'm going to do a bit of bragging too about members and stuff. So I just wanted to let council know in the community that uh, O'Bear's had a successful year. So we've served 297 clients with training, job placement, post-secondary education. We've served 8,206 meals, breakfast and lunch. And we've handed out 300 emergency bags this winter. So that gives a picture of successes and it also gives a picture of needs in the community. So I just want to shout out to Team O'Bear for the work they've done over the last year. Um, and it's nice to know that 297 people from McLeod Lake to the Yukon border, from Hudson Hope to the Alberta border have received service um, from this organization that's been around for 35 years. And my second um, item I'd like to talk about, I've talked to my family, I have the support of my board, I've talked to people in the community, so I want to let, I have touched base with Mayor and Council, and I would like to everyone to know that I am going to put my name forward for the position of Mayor in the next municipal election. Um, and seeing three, the current and two others in the room, uh, those are big shoes to fill, but I'm up for the challenge. And I welcome anyone in the community that would like to come and ask me any questions. So thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Good job. And good job on O'Bear. That's, you know, those services that are provided in our community sometimes are invisible to folks and unless you're in there and you really realize and appreciate what is involved. So thank you so much for that. Good job. To, and to the entire team. Yes. Great team. Councillor Jovekov. So, um, with the provincial government's announcement that the uh, VAX mandate is going to be eliminated on April 8th, and in the interests of getting some events back in the Oventive Centre, the South B. Soilmans is going to resurrect after three years uh, Lobster Fest, and um, it is put on to celebrate the oil and gas industry. So we're really happy that uh, May 7th, we will see Lobster Fest again after a three-year hiatus. I'll buy the first ticket. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, that's great news. Good job, uh, really good. And yeah, the, I think the aspect for us of getting uh, our community back to hosting events and back to opening is exciting to all of us. So that's great news. Thank you. Councillor Earl. Thank you, Worship. I'll try and be quick. Uh, first things first, and I know this is usually Councillor Parslow who, who does this, but I did want to highlight that the Bear Mountain Nordic Ski Association was awarded $135,000 through the, uh, I think, NCLGA's, or, or uh, NDIT, sorry, the uh, uh, Recreational Infrastructure Program for a a uh, new snow crack groomer. Um, so congratulations to them. I know they have uh, a number of our residents enjoy their facility. And um, my other hat I wear at Lakeview Credit Union, we also uh, contributed some money to their organization a few years ago through our Community Social Responsibility Fund. And I wanted to uh, kick it out to the public that our fund is once again uh, doing intake till April 1st. So go to the website. And uh, if you've got a project through your nonprofit, please uh, put in an application, try and take advantage of that. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, everybody. Um, so we'll move to our minutes, adoption of the minutes, 5.1 minutes of our public uh, consultation for February 22nd for adoption. Councillor uh, Dober, Councillor Wilbur, all those in favor, voting has started. Opposed? It's carried, thank you. 
and the minutes of our meeting, regular meeting of council with the Committee of the Whole, February 28th for adoption. Move, Councillor Kemp. Second, Councillor Wilbur. Thank you. All those in favor? Opposed? And it's carried. Thank you. Is there any business arising out of those minutes for anybody before we move to 6.1? 6.1 is business arising, and this is report 2023 from the Director of Infrastructure regarding the 102nd Avenue Crossing Replacement Project update. Blair, do you want to speak to it? Your Worship, at the last meeting, there was a report presented that needed some clarification. We had to put it off until this meeting. I will have Kevin speak to this. Uh, this is the 102nd Avenue bridge that we put in. We are looking at the possibility of expanding some of the work um, that occurred. You will see to the north side the riprap that has gone up a partial way to 17th Street. We are looking at uh, completing that riprap over to the 17th Street uh, portion. And um, the report, I think, covers what the issues are, what the costs are. And if there's anything, Kevin, I would pass it to you to add for that. Thank you, Blair. Kevin? Good morning. Welcome back. Um, yeah, welcome back is right. Happy to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Got a little Pinocchio going yeah. there. <laughs> so uh, first off, I want to thank Devin for uh, putting this uh, report together for council. I think it, it lays out all the information. I think really, you know, the crux of it is, is if does council want to move forward with a project uh, such as the riprap? If we do, uh, I think Devin's laid out a process for that. I think um, the intent is to utilize the existing uh, consultant, which is Morsh and Hirschfield. Uh, they have the um, background uh, from doing the 102 crossing project. And uh, we need to do the engineering design and permitting first before we go uh, too far down the, the road. And, and it appears from everything we're hearing that that uh, permitting process could take a significant amount of time. So council just needs to be aware that there is a chance and probably a good chance that this project would not um, be completed this year, just based on what we're hearing. Maybe it would be, but um, I think the permitting process could take some time. If we can get through that, then we're able to, to tender a project uh, out to the local contracting community and see what we can get for prices. Thank you, Kevin. Council, I'm looking for a motion. Yep. Councilor Parslow. I'd like to move the report number 22-023 from the Director of Infrastructure. The 102nd Avenue Crossing Replacement Project update be received. Further, the Council directs staff to work with Morrison Hirschfield to prepare the design for the full expanded scope of the project with the intent to apply for permitting and to tender the construction of the work. Thank you, Councillor. Second, Councillor Dober. Discussion? Councillor Parslow, go ahead. Well, the good news about this project is that the the 102nd crossing came in under budget, which is um, a remarkable achievement for the city, given other projects and how they've gone, and that we're able to retain the, the uh, grant that we receive, which is about three quarters of a million dollars, to apply this to this project. And uh, rip wrapping was, uh, or armoring up our treat in this area, I think is a very important thing. The report that was presented to council at our last meeting had uh, some questions um, that uh, were raised in council mind, and, and I am at a loss to understand those questions, so I can't speak to them at all. But uh, I'm wondering if staff could uh, uh, address the questions that were raised last time and how they've been. There was just some uncertainty in terms of the quotes for Morgan Hirschfield if we go direct versus bid and uh, and between the design build or a tender for that it's my recollection Blair I think one of the major questions that came of which I didn't have an answer for at the time um, was the why was there a four hundred thousand dollar and I'm going by memory but a difference when you look um, there's significant price differences on the three options that were contained yeah. in that report the biggest one was it was reduced scope and part of one of them spoke to reduce scope the other didn't although it was a reduced scope so that would be the big difference um, 
And in Kevin's absence, I certainly did not um, have an answer for that. So certainly having Kevin back here today is welcome. Um, but that would be the most significant issue. It was raised by Councillor Javakov. I did not have an answer. So um, tabling right. it was the right thing to do to get that and bring it back. So. And this project is the full stroke. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Councillor Earl. Thank you, Worship, and uh, good to have you back, Kevin. So I, uh, we've, we've done a significant amount of work on flood mitigation over the last few years between um, the, the sewer cleaning this year, the 8th Street Bridge coming in, and, and uh, 102nd Ave, or 105th, right? 100, oh, um, Mondays. Um, but between this bridge, uh, I think the only remaining choke point I can think of is the 17th Street, um, which has a tendency to overtop a little bit with water when we get some significant runoff or rain. Uh, my question is, if we were in the not-too-distant future to discover some funding available to replace that, that bridge with, with something um, better, would the ri if we were to riprap to the 17th Street bridge, would we potentially have to tear it up and replace it if we were looking to replace that bridge at some point in the not too distant future? I just want to make sure we're not wasting effort. Kevin? Yeah, through your worship. Um, so a couple of things. Yes, you're correct. 17th Street is, is another choke point. It is a bit problematic to to alter that just by nature of how shallow the creek is there and how flat the lands are. And, and so if we were to look to upgrade that crossing, it would be a fairly significant piece of work um, to have to raise it up so it wouldn't overtop. Um, so I think, uh, yes, we would probably have to do some alteration to this riprap if we were to do that project. I guess from my point of view, I don't know that um, replacing that crossing would be necessarily money well spent because I think... With this 102nd, um, we've got access around. We may have what we would call maybe nuisance flooding at 17th Street there, where it might overtop for a day, day and a half, and then it, it recedes. And so if we're willing to live with that, um, perhaps, because even if we were to raise that crossing, the properties that are on either side of that are still likely to flood. So that bridge itself probably wouldn't eliminate that. So I guess that would be a decision that we'd have to look at. But, but I guess the, the long answer there is yes, we, we may have to alter some riprap if we were ever to consider that project. I think the message really for anybody watching is this is a, all about flood mitigation. The Ebwater report that we've done and all the work we did in regards to understanding that was it's reducing the risk, but it's not eliminating the risk. And we're always going to face the risk the more you, the further west you go from 17th Street, it's a flood plain and we experience that flood in there. And so all of this work is just about flood mitigation and it's minimizing risk, but not eliminating. Absolutely. Councillor Javeka. Um, so the uh, $115,000 for the engineering firm, is that a quote from the firm for the additional work that they have to do? Yes, through your worship, that is. Um, that is an estimate they provided, a quote that would include uh, design services uh, through permitting and then also any on-site inspections that would be required as part of the permitting. So that's uh, the design and uh, monitoring the construction? That's correct. Um, so the originally we talked about uh, doing some additional armoring downstream from the bridge. Uh, what, why was it uh, changed to look at the upstream portion? So through your worship, the reason we looked upstream is just, it was kind of trying to finish that off. It's much more visible as well between uh, 17th Street 102 in that area. So it's just really trying to address that, armoring that up. Um, downstream, uh, the soil seemed to be a little less stable. We've already um, seen that there is a bit of sloughing even uh, just beyond the work uh, that we completed last year. So um, I think there is a bit of concern about the stability of the banks there as well, which um, the armoring actually won't necessarily um, improve. So uh, I would be concerned about going down that way as well. So it's more for aesthetics. 
So the other thing that is a concern, um, there's a comment here that uh, the project wouldn't likely be finished till the end of 2023. So is that uh, additional funding that we haven't used yet, the 750,000, um, going to still be available? Yes, Your Worship. Uh, yes, we've we've contacted the grant provider on that, and the reason that we've said twenty three is just simply we anticipate the permitting to take some time, so that may limit what we can do in twenty two. So the uh, five hundred and ninety seven thousand that wasn't used for the for the original project. Is any of that required to complete the project, or is it all, uh, does it all go into reserve? So Three Your Worship, what I see here is if we go with that, we would have to use 237,000 of that from the carry forward. So that money isn't required for the, to complete the project. The project is completed as it stands now. Oh, oh sorry. And yeah. that's surplus money. Correct. Sorry, I misunderstood. So whatever's uh, whatever's not used for the for the extension will be in go into reserve of some sort. Through your worship, so the money that is left from the original allotment for the hundred and second crossing would be utilized <clears throat> should council choose to proceed with this project we're speaking about. We would use the remainder of the funds up to the full amount, and then we would need to put in additional dollars as well. So uh, if we don't do this project, we hand the, the excess money back to the government. That's why I think it's important. Um, that's why we're talking about this, is to use it, get a very good, I think, uh, extension to the work that was done for a very limited cost of the city of Dawson Creek, if that makes sense. So the only other issue to me then is the, we haven't done any plans yet for the 102nd Street or the 17th Street crossing. And um, I believe it's in the works, I mean, to, to get a design for that of some sort. So the work that's done up to 17th Street will have to be uh, um, affected somehow if, if we proceed with uh, improving that crossing. And I... I think we're going to have to proceed with it because, uh, you know, it is an issue. I mean, um, anyways, I support the project uh, on, the, on that basis. I just wanted a better understanding for it, and I think the aesthetics between the two crossings are important, too. Thank you. Um, any further comments? Two things, I think, for me. We got uh, the seven million we got from the federal infrastructure program flowed through the uh, to the project to allow us to build the bridge at 102nd, as, as, along with um, the completion of that. Gave us uh, the completion of it left us with seven hundred fifty thousand um, dollars. This project for us to uh, improve that riprap um, from 17th to 102nd, uh, as well as I think we'll also improve the. Uh, impacts to those properties east of um, the bridge and the creek and uh, for us to have a total project of 987 still 750 is funded by the uh, grant so we got $237,000 approximately that will be used for this. I think it's great work for our staff to be able to one leverage and get us the infrastructure grant of 7 million get the project done within at in time uh, and under budget and now to allow us to do some further work. So I really congratulations to administration for doing a really great job on it and we appreciate the information. With that, I'm gonna call the question. Are you ready for the vote? All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Yes, go ahead. This is related to the previous topic. Um, the the land the the creek west of 17th Street, which was uh, there was a it was paved, I think the Rotary Club and so on, and it's now uh, has, has there been much dialogue with the Rotary Club in, in around the development of that 
and and some ponds that could be there that might mitigate some f flooding um, in that area. Uh, has has the, has the staff been involved in any discussions? Through Your Worship, um, we were contacted sometime a number of months ago. I'll use six months ago, roughly. There yeah, was an, I've got something in my long term yeah, memory. There was a, an interest um, by the Rotary Club to look at possibly uh, taking part in some development of some sort in that area. Uh, that is as far as it has gone. There okay. has been nothing further. Okay. Thank you. Uh, our next item, uh, 7.1, is an email from Gloria Cleave, Administrative Assistant from South Peace Building Together, uh, Learning Together Society. This uh, email came to us as a result of the public budget consultation, uh, and we indicated that at that time we would bring it back for Council's discussion and um, consideration. And uh, so to me, I honestly have been involved in trying to deal with and develop some sort of a component of childcare for our community. And it's really arisen from the work through um, the new hospital and through the health services and hearing it consistently and continuously and doing the work with those organizations that healthcare cannot be under, childcare cannot be understated how important it is for our community. And um, even the, as recently as a month ago when I was talking to some of the, a nurse, she said it, it affects the recruitment of nurses into our community because if there's no adequate appropriate healthcare, they're not coming because healthcare is one of those critical components for people who come into our community as professionals and or those who are working to be able to have uh, uh, adequate and appropriate and accessible and affordable health care. And to me, the request that these guys have made is for us to take um, the, a lead as a leadership role in helping to develop a child care action plan so that we understand what are the gaps, what are the areas that we need to address to ensure that we got a plan in place for uh, child care. People can say, well, is that the role of the city? Um, probably not. but. Um, if we don't do something, it is impacting our community. So I'm going to stop there, Councillor uh, Dober first. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Can I just, I, I got a question, maybe sure. you'll be able to answer towards this, but, um, you know, I agree, like maybe it's not the city, but I think this all, all this kind of stuff benefits our city and makes it a more attractive place to, to have this, these kind of things. But it's kind of vague in here, like what it's asking of the city and how much time that is because you know I know with all the changes we've made um, you know our staffing is pretty tight in a lot of areas so is this something that they're looking for us to do all of it or they're to work with them on it like is it can I we even help it, do we even have that yeah, UBCM had a, a grant available for 20 grand I think to help a community develop a child care action strategy and there are companies and out there then that you would hire to do the surveys and put the necessary information together and I think that's what it would be it certainly wouldn't be something our staff would do but may help facilitate but it would be hiring somebody and then working with community organizations like the South Peace Building Learning Together the child care provider uh, that uh, providers both public and private to be able to put that Child care. But you would. Uh, this would be funding uh, a firm to put the child care action plan data and information together on behalf of the community. So, should we, do we need a motion just to be able to look into it, or is it something that the staff can just look into? Like yeah, I think we were going to require a motion for council to consider uh, funding uh, a child care actions plan. I would make the motion that we um, have. Is that right? Staff look into um, what this would entail for us to to be able to help fund it. Fund it, yeah. Thank you. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Kemp, discussion? Councillor uh, Javekov, you are next. So I think originally we turned down the notion of us, of the city doing the plan. This uh, memo reads like the way I read it. The BLT Society would like to create a Dawson Creek Child Care Action Plan. So does that mean that they are actually going to do the planning or, or uh, ramrod it and they just need support? That's what it sounds like. They just need some support from the city. Uh, or am I misreading it? 
So I, I think the question that they're asking is, um, would the city take the lead in f providing the financial support to assist in the development of the Child Care Action Plan? And that was their question. Would the city of Dawson Creek please financially assist in the creation of it? And I think if we're involved in it, funding it, then we need to absolutely have an input into what it is, but working with them collaboratively on what it's going to take to create that Child Care Action Plan. <clears throat> the way I look at it, I, I thought this organization uh, could head it up and the city could help them provide funding. I mean, if there's UBCM funding, the city could apply for that. And there's also potential NDIT funding. So um, I think originally we, we turned down the notion of the city actually taking on the responsibility to do the, to do the plan that uh, one of these organizations should take it on. Yeah, when I brought it up last year, it was uh, the U Union of BC Municipalities, UBCM, did have a fund, a grant available to help, but that ended, uh, we weren't able to qualify for it. And certainly that's the issue right now and why we uh, haven't acted on that request they made of us last fall and the delegation was, and council made the motion, if we could find the funding to help uh, create it, we would move forward with it. But they're just we just haven't been able to uh, find any grant funding available for it is the issue. So is the UBCM funding not available? No. And how about NDIT? Um, I don't believe there's an NDIT grant available for it, is my understanding. And I know staff have been working away on it, trying to find the grant funding for it. Blair? Just a, an update, Your Worship. I know staff are um, grant writer... Um, has been looking for funding f to access for this very reason. Uh, to date, we have been unsuccessful in finding that funding uh, that would come forward. The other thing, should council decide to take this on, I do want to be in an election year with all of what's going on, I would recommend that it would have to be contracted out. To do this in-house with the work that's already before uh, the administrative staff upstairs may be very difficult to accomplish this year. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, I think, Blair, part of this to me is you guys bring back a report to council and say, okay, here, we've engaged with these guys. Here's what it's going to take to facilitate it. And it's going to be 10 grand, 20 grand, 50 grand or whatever. Councillor uh, Earl. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, so a couple notes I'd like, a couple things I'd like to, I guess, put on staff's radar as, as we look for this report. Um, I think, and I'm not 100% sure, but I'm fairly certain that the uh, Ministry of Education has been, at the provincial level, has been updated to include the early um, child care component. Um, and, and that was a recent announcement with a, um, some changes made. So there may be some different dynamics there around responsibilities. Uh, to Council Javetkoff's point, I, I also um, I, I am hesitant about uploading more obligations and work onto ourselves and our staff as a contract. Um, that's fine. I would like to mention through my work on the Northeast Regional Community Foundation, um, not all the uh, T's have been crossed and I's have been dotted, but the, this organization did qualify for $4,000 in funding to put towards this work. And I know they're also approaching industry for additional funding. So uh, it would be worth, as part of that report, knowing what funding they've secured so far to offset that $25,000. Thank you. Councillor Wilbur. Thank you. Um, Something that always comes to mind for me is so there's totally a difference between the city or a municipality looking for grant funding to help pay for something versus the group themselves. So um, I will reach out to them. So similar to some of the examples Councillor Earl has given, um, O'Bear actually has access to the Grant Foundation of Canada. And so last year, $800,000 was put into our community through those foundations. So I think sometimes when... Um, and not just our grant writer, but when grant writers look and they're work coming from the municipal aspect, we as a municipality don't qualify for some of those grants where the not-for-profit themselves does. So I will touch base if that's okay and just say here's another opportunity and help them look. But I think if we're looking as a municipality, we're not going to find extra funding for that, but I think the group themselves can. 
Yeah, and I guess that was the delegation when they came here last fall said they haven't been able to get any grant funding and would the city uh, take it on? So, Councillor uh, Parslow. Well, the Northern Healthy Communities Fund is certainly available. I mean, the objective, of, I'm just reading this, the objective of the Northern Healthy Communities Fund is to fund initiative to support the healthy, sustainable, and resilient communities facing rapid and large-scale economic development and associate need for enhanced social service readiness. The, the capacity building program provides grant funding to local governments and indigenous nations that are adjacent to the projects and not-for-profit profits that provide services within those communities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's, uh, it's uh, up to 100,000. And the applicant um, recipients are required to provide a minimum of 10% of the eligible project budget from other contributions. So um, they can be in kind as well. So I, I, I think this, this um, fits the bill. However, I think we've tapped into this as a city once, have we not? Um, I'm looking at you here, actually. <laughs> City hasn't. No. no. Okay, I was thinking of the um, the Southeast Health Services Society. Ah, thank you, yeah, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Thank yeah. you. Correct. Yeah. Just my memory is nearly perfect. Not <laughs> so. Here's an opportunity. I don't see why why they can't apply for that. And uh, the uh, intake would be. We have a meeting this Friday, so they've got a couple of months before they next intake. Should be done. Could be done by the summer. Yeah. So, staff, uh, uh, do you, did you have this? This was a new grant, right? Uh, I'm wondering. I think it does uh, fit the bill. Thank you. Uh, our st our grant writer will have the information. I know she's reaching out every day to look for new opportunities. It is key when I read the question contained in Gloria's letter, it is would the city of Dawson Creek financially assist? So they're not asking for anything further than financial assistance. It may be um, that if we're able to lead them to a grant, uh, maybe the work our grant writer could do, but we will execute on the wishes of yourselves. So I, I, we have a motion, do we? No. Yeah. We have a motion. Can I just add one other thing? Uh, outreach and public engagement are legitimate application things. So it's, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm uh, only going by what the delegation gave to us last fall when they were here. I believe it was last fall, or maybe it was even earlier than that, if they were here. Um, because we probably didn't have delegations last fall, maybe it was in the summer, uh, but they made the request of council to take the lead in financially supporting the development of a child care action plan. Um, and we directed them that we would do that if we could obtain or find grant funding was the direction we made, but we couldn't find any. And so that's, I think, the direction we provided back to them, Blair. So now we've got a direction we're going to request administration to bring us back a report uh, to con contact the group, uh, discover what it's going to take to build a child care action plan from them and what they're requiring exactly from us and what that financial support would be to do that. Blair? Would it, we can reach out to them to accomplish exactly that uh, through the report. Would it be your wish to have them present to council as well or just to get us the information back uh, and we will then bring it to yourselves at our next meeting if that's possible? Yeah, I think we, if we can just reach out to them and say, okay, if you guys are willing to um, take the lead and develop this child care action plan and you're just looking for financial assistance from the city, what is that? And then we can bring that back and council can consider it, I guess. Councillor Dover? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, yeah, that was my intent, making the motion, is just that letter was pretty vague on what they're asking for the city, so I was just thinking you could reach out and just get more details on what they actually want. Is it $5,000? Is it $100,000? Like, it's, you know, there's not much to commit to in that letter. Hmm. So I just wanted a little bit more knowledge on it, is why I kind of Thank you. The motion. We'll, we'll go to work with them and, and see if we can 
find out what the uh, quantify what it is the child creation of a child care action plan would be. Um, any further questions? All are you ready for the question? All those in favor? Opposed? And it's carried. Thank you. Again, it went by me fast. Um, thank you for that. Good discussion, Council. 7.2, letter from Connie Patterson, President of the Dawson Creek and District Exhibition Association regarding a request to put up 60 banners throughout towns and light posts from July to August. Councillor Dober. I'll make a motion that we allow the Dawson Creek Exhibition um, to put banners up on our posts, obviously within working with the city on which ones are the most appropriate to be on. So. Thank you. Do I have a seconder? Councillor uh, Kemp, discussion? Councillor... I think... Oh. Parswell, go ahead. No. No. Councillor Earl, go ahead. Thank you, Worship. Just one quick question, and I, I don't know if, if we've got more information or it's just what is detailed in this request. Uh, and knowing Connie and how good she is at, at getting volunteers and fundraising, I'd imagine the answer is no, but just to confirm, uh, with res this request, is there any hard cost to the city? Blair? Through your worship, no, there is no cost to the city on this. They will be purchasing their banners and be looking for a contribution from a contractor to put them up. So no cost to the city. Thank you. 100th anniversary or Centennial Fair, a really big, big event this year for them. And I think really appropriate that we try to do everything we can to promote that within the city and region of how important the event is to us, not only this year, but every year. Councillor Dober, you had one more? Good, thank you. Any further discussion? Are you ready for the question? All in favor? Opposed? It's carried, thank you. <laughs> we all sit there with bated yeah, breath. Uh, 7.3, I understand, has been withdrawn. It has, Your Worship. 7.4, we have a letter from Mike Peabody, Acting Mayor of the City of Cranbrook, regarding a request for provincial governments to increase its funding to public libraries. Councillor Earl. Uh, do you want me to read the motion? In yes, please. Entirety? Okay. Uh, so move the motion uh, put forward by the Acting Mayor Cranbrook, whereas libraries in British Columbia are largely funded by the property tax base of local governments and provincial library funding has remained stagnant for the past 13 years, whereas public libraries are central to communities providing equi equitable access to vital resources, including internet computers, digital library tools, and in-person services from expert staff. And whereas public libraries provide British Columbians with low barrier services, that support job seekers and small businesses, that increase literacy in communities, that advance reconciliation with Indigenous peoples, and that promote equity and inclusion, therefore be it resolved that the province of BC be requested to immediately increase funding to public libraries in BC to provide long-term sustainable funding, including regular increases in future years. Thank you. Second, Councillor Dober. Discussion? Uh, Mr. Earl, go ahead. Yeah, I know we've had, um, we, we've asked a lot of our public library over the last couple of years in our budgeting decisions um, that has seen a reduction in their funding. And um, while it w may have been a necessary choice, it, it was made that much harder for them by the fact that uh, the provincial government has not been uh, allocating money uh, that, you know, we, we're often concerned about how we keep up with those inflationary costs. Um, and uh, those inflationary costs are made worse by the fact that the provincial government isn't uh, matching those. So I, I think it's appropriate. I, I think given the service that they provide to everyone in our community, but especially some of the most vulnerable, um, it, it's not unreasonable. And I hope uh, they'll do it and we can send that message as a council. Thank you, Councillor. Any further discussion? Are you ready for the question? All in favor? Opposed? And it's carried, thank you. Uh, 7.5, we have a letter from Martin Johansson, Mayor of the Town of Oliver, regarding a letter of support for the BC wildfires petition. Councillor Javekov. Move that was received for information. Thank you. Do I have a seconder? 
Councillor uh, Dober. All those in, sorry, all those in favor? Opposed? It's carried, thank you. We're 10.30, so I think we'll take a seven minute coffee break and we'll be back at 10.37. Our next, we'll resume our, now our agenda. We were in, uh, just going into item eight reports, 8.1. We have report number 22024 from the corporate officer regarding our local government election this year in October. And we need to get our chief election officer appointments completed. Councillor, sorry, Councillor Earl, go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship. I'll move the recommendation that report number 22024 from the corporate officer regarding 2022 local government election chief election officer appointments be received. Further, that Brenda Ginter be appointed as the chief election officer and Joanne Caldicott be appointed as deputy chief election officer. Thank you. Second, Councillor Dober. Discussion? You ready for the question? All in favor? Sorry? Oh, go ahead, Councillor Brenda Parsons. on her appointment. Uh, <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Excuse me, Three Worship. This is great timing because we just received our elections manual. It's about oh, good. this big just today. So, good Got to a go. couple of weeks then to start <laughs> reading. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and you ready for the question? All in favor voting? There you go. Opposed? And it's carried, thank you. Uh, 8.2, we have report number 22022 from the Capital Project Manager regarding RFQ 2022-06-2022 for our Capital Works PVC pipe. Councillor Dober. Oh, thank you, Worship. I'll make a motion that report number 22-022 from the Capital Projects Manager reason a request for quotation 2020 2-06 Capital Works PVC pipe municipal utility materials be received. Further, that council award the contract from RFQ 2022-06 for the 2022 Capital Works PVC pipe. Municipal utility materials excluding Site 4 materials to Iconics Waterworks LP for the bid price of $353,234.35 plus GST. Thank you. Can I talk to it? Yeah, I'll, if I get a seconder. Councillor Kemp, go ahead. Councillor Dover. Um, I just had a question to uh, to staff. I just reading through this, is this number in line with the budget? It didn't, I, maybe I missed something in there. I didn't see if it said that it's below or at the budget or above it. Kevin? Yeah, through your worship. The numbers are a little higher than what we estimated. Obviously, it fits within our overall budget of uh, of the project because it's just one component of the bigger project. But what we're seeing and what I'm, we're <laughs> hearing with everything that's going on in the world is that um, we're seeing some price escalations. So later this week, the the tenders close for the road projects. And that's going to be a pretty good indicator of just where we're at. So, um, but. I guess short answer is yes, the um, the prices are up from what we originally estimated, but they still fit within the overall like, budget. How much are they up? Do you know? How, how they well, we're seeing anything from 20, 30 percent well, higher than what it'll be tough to say with what um, fuel prices are doing and, and all that and such uh, implications on that. This particular one is, is uh, a supply shortage for PVC yeah. everywhere. So that that's driving prices uh, along with probably the uh, the fuel issues. So if we don't do something now, it's it looks like it's still going to go up more. Just with it's all the likely other to be issues. more expensive tomorrow. Okay, thank you, Blair. Your Worship, just you will note that uh, site four, location four, that is the hundred and fourth, hundred and eighth Avenue to one hundred and seventeenth addition to feed the area of development on the south side of town on 17th street so right now i believe and kevin jump in we are looking at options there the pvc pipe necessary for that job would not show up until august 15th which would be uh, put us in a very difficult position to see that project completed this year if at all possible there are some options we're looking at but um, 
that is why Site 4 is out. We also have uh, a call in to the developer as well to have a discussion with him. So. Thank you. Councillor Javakov. <clears throat> so I was just wondering if there's an indication from the suppliers on uh, delivery times, like if it's going to be fairly quick or quick enough for us or... So through your worship, um, what you see here in the report, this particular pipe for our road projects, they've committed to getting um, the schedule, which is uh, 1st of June. So that's that's good for us. The the site four materials, which is a larger diameter pipe, and that's why um, it's more problematic to get, and that's why that potential delivery would be pushed till till August, and that's why we're looking at options, and we've removed it at this point in time. So it won't, it shouldn't affect the uh, deadlines for the construction contractors. No, not at this point. Councillor Parsley, just to. Councillor Dober's uh, inquiry about inflation things. Uh, example of inflation that I'm on top of right now is deflector baffles for the indoor range, which were budgeted for 40,000. It last fall, around Christmas time, was 70,000, and now they're 100,000. Just to illustrate what's going on. It's worrisome, and I guess on that point, for us, we'll really have uh, we we'll really need to be involved in that because if we see a real escalation in prices this year, on I'm, I guess I'm particularly worried about paving. <coughs> um, I think that's a uh, dis discussion we absolutely are going to have to have because there's no way we can say a 50 or 100 percent increase over what we're budgeted for that we absolutely may need to be prepared for that discussion this year. I think, anyway. Councillor Earl? Uh, yes, Your Worship, I agree. I know we as a, a city are entering into some borrowing in order to shore up our paving program. And, you know, initially I was lukewarm on that issue, but, but what got me off the fence was uh, the long-term savings of, of doing the work before uh, the roads are completely failed, and, and that would justify the debt servicing costs, but if we're seeing, you know, and, and hopefully it is a temporary blip, uh, an increase in, in price of 20 to 30 percent, uh, that cost benefit analysis does change. So it is something I'm going to be mindful of, and, and I assume we're going to have some more discussion on as we get better figures. For sure. Thank you. Um, thank you. Although, uh, so I'm ready for the question. All in favor? Opposed? And it's carried, thank you. Item 8.3, um, we have a report number 22026 from the Development Services Manager regarding the Northeast Métis Association request for elder and accessible parking at 1005 102nd Avenue. We had an email uh, that's included in the package um, that the Métis office is located on 103rd Avenue just off of the 10th Street and... Um, it's a busy area for parking, and they've asked, I made a request uh, for parking availability for their elder resource instructors. And uh, so we have the report uh, attached from our staff in regards to this request that's um, uh, provided for uh, under our parking bylaw. Councillor Kemp. Thank you, Your Worship. I'd like to move the recommendation, the report number 22-026 from the Development Services Manager regarding Northeast Métis Association request for elder and accessible parking at 105th and 102nd Avenue be received. Further, that staff be directed to research and bring forward a parking regulation amendment bylaw that includes provisions for elder seniors parking in the downtown area. Thank you. Second. Councillor Earl, discussion? Councillor Wilbur. Sorry, Councillor Earl, go ahead. Cool. Thank you, Your Worship, and, and thank you, staff, for um, the report and specifically the, the recommendation and the wording. I think, um, you know, accessibility is something we're all aware of and sensitive to, um, but we're also uh, always have to be aware as a, as a government, as a level of government, of the concept of precedent 
and that what we do for one, we have to do for all. So getting some idea as to what other municipalities do around this issue and how it can be applied in a fair and even-handed fashion would be very, very helpful in making this decision. Thank you. Further discussion, Councillor Wilbur? Um, thank you. Um, and yes, and I'll appreciate that, um, getting the information back and about setting precedent. So thank you, Councillor Earl. But uh, there are many businesses down there that do have um, clients who need accessibility, and we do have a handicapped parking um, right at this particular location. I, I mean, I, I do believe it's something to work into, but um, I'm mindful that there are a lot of businesses in that corridor. They do have to move their vehicles every two hours as our bylaw sits. Um, and uh, there is some stuff in the works to have a parking parking area down there for people that are, are in that area. So whether it be Lawrence's Meats or the Chamber or O'Bear or Brass Scissors or, I mean, it's, it's downtown, but we do have a handicapped parking space right next to this business. That is where it is. So um, I'll be happy to see the report come back, but at the same time, um, I don't want to be in a position where you do for one, you do for all, and now we're changing all of our parking downtown. Thank you. Councillor Javeka, or sorry, Councillor uh, Earl. Oh, sorry. Councillor Parslow. I guess this is really aligned with what Councillor Wilbur was saying, that um, I, I'm certainly in favour of something for the elders and those who are physically challenged are having some reserved parking, but if we just provide it for instructors, uh, I, I see, I view that very differently. And um, I, um, anyway, we'll see what happens. But again, this should just mushroom into a uncontrollable issue. Thank you. Councillor Jureka. <clears throat> so I've been by there a few times because I was, had to do some business down that area and I could never find a parking place down there. It's always 100% occupied. So I went down by the hair salon on uh, 10th Street. But I'm wondering uh, if there's an opportunity maybe to look at some, one of the lots that we own for uh, parking for that area because, uh, you know, the people that work there have to park but there's also people that want to do business there, like that want to drive in and do business for 10 minutes and then leave. So uh, the option of finding a lot maybe for the longer term parking would be uh, worthwhile, I think. Thank you. Councillor uh, Dober. Thank you, Worship. Right, just one question, I guess, the bylaw now is that the t is two hours parking there. Like, do we monitor that? Because I... There's somebody down there often. Yeah, so three worship. Um, so we respond on a complaint basis. So it's two hour parking. If we get complaints from a business that someone's been there for longer than that, then we will come out and do the entire block, both sides, because we won't just go and do one. While we're out, we'll look at both. But that's how we typically respond. Thank, Thank you. you. Any further discussion? Are you ready for the question? All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Thank you. Uh, item 9 is bylaws. And so 9.1, uh, we have bylaw notice enforcement amendment bylaw number 4517-2022 for adoption. Councillor Wilbur, second. Councillor Kemp, discussion. All those in favor, sorry. All those in favor? Opposed? And it's carried, thank you. Report nine point, number item nine two, we're sorry, report number 22020 from the Chief Financial Officer regarding our financial plan bylaw number 4520 for consideration of first three readings. Councillor Parslow. I move the report number 22-020 from the CFO. The 2022 to 2026 financial plan bylaw number 4520-2022 be received. Further, that the 2022 to 2026 financial plan bylaw number 4520-2022 
to be given first three readings. Thank you. Second, Councillor Wilbur. Discussion? Are you ready for the question? All in, f sorry. All in favor? Opposed? <coughs> and it's carried, thank you. Man, it went fast. Um, item 10 is Mayor's business. I got a couple items uh, quickly to update council on. Had a meeting with TC Energy um, in regards to some continual uh, development that they're seeing in the region and have projects planned for this summer, this fall, that they're just finalizing uh, the permit application process. And uh, it was really encouraging to me to hear that because we will see uh, some impact of that to the community because a couple of the projects are already um, in the planning stages, which will mean that they won't be using camps, but they'll be having those workers in the community and impacting positively our rental accommodation, our hotels and restaurants and the various services of the community. And uh, we they expect that uh, to start this uh, later this uh, summer or this fall. Uh, I had a follow-up conversation with WestJet. Obviously, the whole aspect of WestJet services into our community is so, so important, uh, I believe, to community in the region, and they've been having very difficult times over the last little while. So it was just really a follow-up call with their marketing folks to make sure that we stay in touch with them and give them some of the insights into the economic development of the region and our community uh, and planning of that. So we talked about some of the energy projects, the hospital project, et cetera, and put them in touch with some of the companies that are involved in that for their corporate sales folks. And um, so it's just obviously just keeping that old bums in seats at the uh, WestJet link service is so important. Um, we had a... a sign made for our ongoing kind of partnership with our indigenous uh, neighbors and uh, Doig River have completed their arbor in their community house and we had the sign f uh, made with Leah Black who uh, had the sign designed and built and I took it out last week and presented it to them. Finally in a position where we could attend in person and uh, Doig were extremely um, touched by the uh, offer and gesture of behalf of the city and um, really appreciated it and uh, are going to display it proudly within their community in that demonstration and signal of community to community. Um, I had a meeting with Shell Canada as well as a tour with Tanya, their local community relations um, manager, and uh, just continuing to build upon uh, the work that Shell do in our region and a lead proponent with LNG Canada as the... Um, major partner in that project along with Coastal Gas Link. And uh, so that was kind of the last couple of weeks. Does anybody have any comments or questions on any of that? Councillor Parslow. Well, as I go to the Doig a lot, helping them with different things, I can tell you that uh, your actions were very much appreciated and they enjoyed your company. Yeah. Thank you. Well, and I talked to the Chief about that and certainly we've extended an invitation for Chief and Council to come here and meet with our council and our staff to be able to continue to build that. You know, there's lots of things going on today, and I think the uh, relationship that exists with us and our Treaty 8 neighbours, along with the economic opportunities for us, uh, is really uh, evident today and how important that is, and they've expressed some interest in that, and so we'll be facilitating a joint meeting with their council and our council, um, hopefully in the near future. Thank you. Um, we didn't have any requests from TC Energy in their delegation, and so we'll move to 10.3, and Emily Bernier was here and he updated us on the um, provincial electoral boundary issue, and we did have an email that we received from Justice Nita Lair, Commission Chair, and I would like to propose that we do send a letter outlining our uh, concerns to uh, the electoral area, electoral bound, district boundaries commission, as well as if there is a personal in-person session that council direct um, uh, the mayor to ensure we do a presentation on behalf of mayor and council at that in-person event. Councillor Parzal. I, I so move those two statements you made. Thank you. Second, Councillor Wilmer. Discussion? Councillor Parzal. 
Well, you know, we know our MLA quite well, so I have no problems throwing him a curved ball as, as I did, but I thought his response was excellent. There's lots of darn good <coughs> reasons why we need a strong voice, and um, whilst our population is small, um, what we contribute to the province is significant, and I know from experiences I've had that um, the provincial government seems to think that uh, all provincial governments seem to think that one size fits all, and that is a major mistake. We need people in the legislature who live in this area, who know the area, and can speak passionately about our needs. So uh, I'm, I really believe that the, the platform for this commission is wrong. It shouldn't just be based upon population. Thank you. Any further comments? Uh, you know, I was just thinking about it as Mike was talking. We probably have in the northeast of BC in that huge geography, probably anywhere from 10 to 15 communities, just communities alone. So you're talking mayor and council and, or the regional districts. And then you've got another probably 15 or 20 indigenous communities. So you just think about it, if it's representing population, how does one person have an effective manner in which to be able to effectively interact with the communities that they're representing. Forget about all the other stuff around resource development, economic op uh, issues, et cetera. So I think it's completely nuts that they're considering um, that we would go to a single electoral boundary in Northeast BC. Blair? Your Worship, the other uh, suggestion I would put forward is that we promote the individual's right to respond um, uh, to their website, to the electoral boundaries on our website. Sure. I think it is important. This may be the single most important issue we're going to see, and um, I certainly have my views on it. I couldn't imagine, regardless of your political affiliation, anybody in the Northeast supporting such a ludicrous step as they've made here. Yeah. Good point. And I'm being and as polite as I can. Yeah, absolutely. And I think Councillor Wilbur made that point. It's about also uh, getting our residents. So we'll raise the profile of that as best we can within our all of our uh, venues and with our organizations that we engage with. Thank you. Um, so are you ready for the question, Council? All those in favor? Opposed? And it's carried. Thank you. Uh, Chief Administrative Officer, update? Just a, a couple of quick um, informational pieces. The organizational review that the City of Dawson Creek has undertaken will continue this week. Uh, we will have uh, people in our city meeting with both um, management as well as exempt staff and unionized staff. So looking forward to that opportunity. As well, we have began, we put a policy in place on water, uh, really to pay your bills, uh, up to and including if your bills aren't uh, paid, they, your water could be in jeopardy of being shut off. We have initiated that policy and uh, I think it is working well. We have had a number of people uh, come in uh, to pay, uh, I would say, late debts, uh, many that are many, many years in the making. So um, it is a significant benefit and the reason I bring it up is for every person that doesn't pay their utility bill, the other residents of the city pick that up. So it's working. It's uh, taken a long time to get to this, but the policy that you've adopted is working well at this point. So. Thank you, Blair. Um, diary, nothing new. Consent calendar, we have one item. Um, kind of a motion to accept consent. Councillor Kemp, second Councillor Wilbur. Discussion, Councillor Parslow. Now, this may sound a silly question, a number of years I've been in this seat, but we're, we're by consent here. We're just receiving this for information. So when you have the consent calendar, uh, any item that's on there doesn't contain a specific request of council that we need to provide action on. But when we bring a motion forward to approve the consent calendar, it gives anybody the opportunity to lift an item from the consent calendar that they may wish to discuss or have a question answered about. And if nobody asks a question to uh, raise one of those items from consent, then I would just approve it as received. Yeah, thank you f for that. I, I, when I read this letter, um, I guess I was so incensed about it that I missed the point 
that they were not making any specific request because I'd be vehemently opposed to to what they have uh, requested of Minister Dix. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and that's and that's so that's the consent is unless right. there's a specific request that we need to act upon, but it is addressed to all of Mayor and Council, then we would put it on consent and then council can have the opportunity to know it was there and then raise it and lift it for discussion if they choose. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, all, those, <laughs> all those in favor? Did I get that right? Sorry? <laughs> Opposed? <laughs> I, I thought you were surprised at the eloquence. It's carried, <laughs> and it went by fast again. <laughs> oh. It was carried. It was carried, yeah. I voted for it. Um, and so we now have media questions. I see the media is here, but what I would like to do is if we can, we're going to close. If we can have a motion to recess to close, unless you want to set up your camera and do it with all the council, or do you just have a question for me? Okay, so if I can have a motion then that we recess to close, then we have, as a result of agenda items 4.1 is section 90, the minutes. Agenda item 2.1 is section 91K, negotiations. Agenda item 8.1 is section 91I, which is advice that could be subject to solicitor-client privilege. And agenda items 9, 10, 11, and 12, which are section 91L, discussions for municipal employees and employ officers and employees respecting a objective. So if I can have a motion, Councillor Wilbur, second, Councillor Kemp. All those in favor? Oh, sorry, all those in favor? <laughs> Opposed? And it's carried, thank you. So we'll take a 10 minute break while we get Carl to allow himself to get cleared out and we'll call ourselves back in to close.